Yeah. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Joel Warner. Joel is an award-winning former staff writer for Westward and International Business Times. He's been published in Esquire, Wired, Newsweek, Men's Journal, Men's Health, Bloomberg, Popular Science, and Slate. He's the co-author of an outstanding book, The Humor Code, A Global Search for What Makes Things Funny which was published in Simon & Schuster in 19, excuse me, 2014. It hasn't been that long. It hasn't been that long, no. <laughs> it feels like it. <laughs> and he's the author of the forthcoming The Curse of the Marquis to be published by Crown Publishing Group. Welcome, Joel. Thanks for having me. So this is long overdue, clearly. And I am i don't know if you've done your homework, but uh, I always start with the same question, which is if you weren't working as a writer... What would you be doing? Hmm. Maybe I'd want to be an architect. Hmm. I've okay. always been fascinated by architecture, especially after spending some time in Barcelona. You know, like most young people in Barcelona, I kind of fell in love with Gaudi and all that funky stuff. So yeah, probably an architect. So this is um this is fitting because we're at your home. Yes. And you just gave me a tour of it looks just like a house from Gaudi. It's crazy in here. It's like some surrealist nightmare. It's horrible. Yeah, it looks like it's like it looks like a house that you'd find in the Highlands in in Denver. Imagine that. And uh, but you ha you did a renovation a couple summers ago. I did a renovation a couple summers. Now, ago. did your architectural desires come out? No, I uh, I know enough to to trust the experts and <laughs> all things other than writing. Okay, and so I just I just let the experts do it, and, and I just said make my house slightly larger for and I'll pay you an obscene amount of money to do so. Yeah. Well, they did a lovely job. Yes. So I'm uh, I'm headed to Barcelona this fall. Okay. Never been. Okay. So to be honest, I've heard about Barcelona's museums and art, but I am ignorant about the architecture. Okay. So can I get a quick primer? What should I be looking for? I mean, it's the obvious thing. You'll everyone will mention, oh, go see the work by Antony Gaudí. It's mm -hmm. like their their patron saint of architecture. You know, the Sagrada Familia is the massive kind of cathedral that he started and still being built because it's so oh, ridiculous yes. and huge, oh, yeah. right? So there's a Sagrada Familia. I heard there. you there's like you need to like sign up for this thing. Like it's it's such a big thing. Like the Probably. crowds are out of this. Probably stuff. yeah. Crazy. And there's you know, and he designed this this crazy kind of surrealist park, and there are these houses. So you'll see it. I mean, okay. won't, you won't miss it. He's pretty celebrated. Okay, that's good. I, I I like architecture also. Yeah, I'm kind of a late bloomer in that sense. Okay, have you? Um, I think this has come up before. Have you done the architectural boat tour in Chicago? Yeah, I did it when we were in Chicago. You went off to do something by yourself. <laughs> needed, Pete needed some more, some more like a load time. time. Yeah, Pete, yes. Pete needed some some load time. I don't know what Pete does is a load time. I I never asked. It was from it was for some event for the book, and I'm like, well, I'm going to go be social. Yeah, I went on the boat tour, okay. architectural boat tour. It was nice. <laughs> I, I've done it too at um at a different time, and uh, and just thought it was outstanding. Yeah. I wonder if you did it first or I did it first. In any case, um, actually, that I mean, I'm not suggesting that Chicago's architecture is rivals that of Barcelona in any way, but it's it's one of those things that you know you it, when you get the inside info, it it's magnified. Oh yeah, and the sheer scale of that place is fascinating. Mm -hmm. The sheer scale of some of those buildings, and the and the and doing it on a boat is like super. I remember like being on the boat and thinking. Just for a moment, I could live here. And then remembering. And then getting off the boat and realizing, <laughs> oh, wait, no, I don't want to live in Chicago. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I lived in the in the Midwest and liked it, but but I'm I'm happy. I'm happy here. So I want to talk to you about interviewing. Okay. So I'm I'm now, as a podcaster, interviewing people. Yeah. And um, for better or for worse, 
most of what I've learned about interviewing, I've learned from you. Yeah, you sat in a lot in a lot of interviews. Than I did. I sat in a lot of interviews. We talked a lot about interviewing, and so I so I want to say thank you. You're welcome. Right. So think about how bad this podcast would be if you didn't exist. It was. It would be. A, are you allowed to swear on this? Yes. Yes. It would be a total shit show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it would just be me doing monologues. <laughs> So, you know, as someone who had a lot of experience being interviewed mm -hmm. and, and kind of working that muscle, getting used to getting pretty good at, at that, it, it was a challenge and, and certainly a, a shift to start to interview. So, you know, if you don't mind, I'd actually like you to talk about, so you are a writer, mm -hmm. you've kind of always been a writer and um, a lot of what you write about are these colorful characters. Yep. Right. So you have a, you actually have a term, you have a model of the ideal character for a magnificent obsessive, a magnificent obsessive. And so, so let's, let's talk about that first and then let's get into the, mm -hmm. the kind of um, blocking and tackling of interviews. Yes. So why magnificent obsessives? So this is a term that's been attributed to my former editor at Westward. Her name is uh, Patricia uh, Calhoun and she's an icon in the alternative news weekly space, and I think just the newspaper space, um, she's been, she's always been the editor westward, it's just an incredible human being and writer and editor, and she was attributed to having coined the term magnificent obsessive. This idea that you want to find people who are so obsessed or so passionate about one unique subject that uh, by writing about them, you can draw readers into their magnificent worlds. Mm. The writer is probably most associated with this concept, even if she doesn't use the term, is probably Susan Orlean, who, uh, New Yorker staff writer, wrote the book The Orchid Thief that became the movie adaptation. Oh, uh, of yes. course, was about a magnificent obsessive who was obsessed with collecting and stealing orchids, right? So that's, that's really where, what that, what that term means. I see. Yes. And so, well, we might as well just jump into it. You are writing a book about a magnificent obsessive. Kind of. This book's a little different. Okay. It uh, has a couple different stories. All right. So, and the challenge with a book, I'm writing it. It's nonfiction. It's based on a story I wrote for um, Esquire magazine last year, is that it's not as easy to describe simply as the humor code. We can just say, oh, it's a search for what makes things funny or the yes. science of comedy. Everyone gets it. This book, I'm struggling with, like, the... Uh, the elevator pitch, the short description. So, Pete, uh, the marketing genius, if you have ideas, that's that's fine. <laughs> well, hold on. It must be you must have enough of a pitch that you have a book deal. Yeah, I mean, no, I yeah, it worked. Okay. It worked for the publisher. Okay, it, and that's all that really matters. It worked enough to get <laughs> a good enough book advance, and I get to go to France a lot and all that stuff. But it's like when it when it comes up a conversation, I'm like, how do I just explain this? I see. The I think what I've landed on most recently is. Uh, it's basically the journey of one of the world's most valuable and notorious manuscripts. Okay. Okay. That's the, that's the short description. Mm -hmm. it, I've uh, read the article. Yes. So I know the story. Yes. So, you know, it was basically the manuscript by uh, this French writer named the Marquis de Sade, which uh, is how we have the terms uh, sadism mm -hmm. and sadistic because he was a horrible, horrible individual. He wrote horrible things, treated women horribly. And his most horrible thing he wrote, he wrote it while he was imprisoned in the Bastille. This, uh, this thing is the, literally, the experts call it the worst thing ever written. This is massive novel, just the worst things happen. Is it, is it worse than the aristocrat joke? By far. By far. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, the example I give is that a couple of years ago, Penguin Classics, Literary Pantheon, decided to, to publish an English language version of it. So they hired this really really friendly, proper British professor who was an expert to, to go and translate it. And I got this guy on Skype and I was talking to him and he said to me, literally, this is the worst thing ever written. Yeah, he he's could, like, there's things I cannot unsee. He, he could only spend two hours at a time translating and you have to stop for the day. <laughs> as he wrote in his blog at the Times, he said, at times I don't know if I'm working on the manuscript or the manuscript is working on me. Oh, fascinating. So it's horrible, okay? Yeah. So that's the first thing. And then... This manuscript ended up going on one of these 
crazy centuries long journeys all over Europe, mm -hmm. kind of like the movie The Red Violin, right? Okay. Where it kept popping up in these really fascinating kind of periods. It became this icon of the gay rights movement in early 20th century Berlin. Then it became kind of symbol for the surrealists like Man Ray and Dali in Paris in the 1940s. Okay. It was stolen. There were legal battles. And finally, it was, it was bought for $10 million, one of the largest ever paid for a manuscript and brought back to France in 2014. Okay. And then a few months later, the company and the museum that purchased it was shut down by the French police because it was allegedly the largest Ponzi scheme in French history. The largest... Alleged, because okay. because he hasn't gone to trial yet. Okay. So the book's really these kind of three different narratives. Okay. It's a narrative of the Marquis de Sade, who is a complete, just freak. Asshole. Asshole. Yeah, he's a complete asshole. Like some people say he's an asshole. But did he have willing, I'm curious, does he have willing quote unquote victims? Like did, are, you know. No, that's the thing. People associate him with sex, like yes. naughty sex. Much more violence. Okay. Um, he definitely assaulted, if not raped, prostitutes. Okay. And then what he wrote is much more like literary versions of movies like Saw than Fifty Shades of Grey. I it's see. Much more like torture porn. Mm -hmm. Now, good for me as a writer, he also happened to be this kind of fall into this fascinating moments of French history. He was independently arrested by the last pre-revolutionary king of France, the architect of the reign of terror, and Napoleon. And he, almost, and he outlived almost all of them. So he has some really fascinating stories. I um, see. So there's his story. Then there's a story of his manuscript, and it's like crazy, like journeys through time all over Europe. And then it's a story of this Ponzi scheme, all based on some of the world's most valuable books and manuscripts and all of the characters involved. There are like these dueling booksellers in Paris and like sabotaged high end auctions and all sorts of interesting stuff like that. So for me, it's super fun. Yeah. And I get to go to France a lot. But I speak no French, but it's okay. All right. This sounds like, this does sound like the kind of thing that you, you know, I'm sure you've thought about it. Is could a movie come out of this? I mean, yes. There's it always that a, discussion. It always has a possibility, right? It has like it seems like it has the things that it needs, right? So possibly, yeah. possibly. Um, so fine. Throwing it back to you. I mean, how do you how do you recommend? See, look at this. Now you're interviewing me. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> how? Okay. So when someone says to me next, "Oh, what's your book about?" Yeah. What do I say to them to not? let their kind of eyes glaze over or not force me to like go on for five minutes about Marquis de Sade and Ponzi schemes. Yeah. It's, 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 it let's, gets rough. Let's see if we can workshop it for a few moments. So, I mean, of course the, the way to, that I immediately think about it is it's the X for X. Yeah. Right. Good so point. it's like the, you know, it's, you know, like, so what is, what does it feel familiar Right. What is it? You know, it's, it's sort of the log line for a movie. You yeah. know, it's like. So the red violin probably isn't well known enough. That's probably true. Because it's like that's the way to die. If you say the red violin, people know red violin like, oh, it's the story of this object as it goes through history. Mm -hmm. But most people probably don't know that well. enough. Yeah. I mean, as you're talking about this, I'm, I'm curious, like, so I assume that the marquee is kind of the main element and then you're building the what happens to this manuscript in well, and, you know knowing well, the way you write yeah you're built you're originally i i proposed it with these with basically two intertwined narratives the narrative of the manuscript and the narrative of this crazy ponzi scheme or alleged ponzi scheme and all the people who were whose lives were thrown into turmoil by this ponzi scheme and i proposed it as chapters would alternate. I see. And then my publisher kind of bought the proposal and they said, we love this structure, but we want you to add a third narrative. We want you to add the narrative of the Marquis de Sade. And I was like, that seems like a lot of narratives for a book, but you guys are the, you guys are the bosses. So mm -hmm. I said, okay. So now I have these three narratives and I think probably I'm going to break the book into three parts. First part about Marquis de Sade second part about the scroll, third part about the scheme. I see. So, yeah. Because I just felt otherwise, I think readers just overwhelmed by jumping through all these different times. Yeah, it's a lot to track. Yeah. And now you're following a timeline. Yes. Also, yes. more or less. Yeah. Right. That makes, that makes good sense. You know, I don't have an obvious one, okay. but uh, knowing the way my mind works, 
you might get a text. I should. Me. I'm expecting. <laughs> I'm expecting a response. <laughs> well, nonetheless, it's really quite exciting. Yeah, it's, I'm. I'm happy. You know, I. I. When people ask me about you and um, what you've been up to, I, and I was like, Joel needs to be writing books. You know, you. You can. You can write a lot of words fast and well, and you know, are good at structuring stories, long form stories, which, you know, the world's going short. I like that you're going, that you stayed long. And so I, when you told me about this and that it might, the original Esquire article might turn into a book, I was excited for you because <laughs> thanks man. I want, I, I think I'd like to see you write dozens of books. I'm also thinking of writing this book. What's called stick to business. <laughs> thinking about it. Talk to an agent about it for the day. Kind of like that. We'll see what happens. Yeah, good luck getting the website. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if, if anybody listened to the update last week, or, well, not last week, a little while ago, you would know that that's, I'm actually working on something not nearly as fast <laughs> as, as Joel is probably turning this out nonetheless. So let's get back to this interview yeah. idea, which is, so when I met you, um, you were working for Westward. Yes. And you were seeking out Magnificent Obsessives and other doing other fun mm -hmm. stories, yeah. long-form stories. You, We got to know each other because you wrote 6,000-word story for Westward about... Felt much longer. The work okay. of... Well, actually, it was funny you say this because... I, I was really proud of it. It was, you know, it was, it was, I thought, an outstanding story, and I sent it out to a lot of friends, and I was getting, like, emails and text messages back, like, I've been reading for 20 minutes. I like it. All your friends, like, clearly and, don't know how to read. It's, not, it's like, this is not over yet. Um, so they, but you had back then a, like, little collapsible, what was it, like, type, not type, a keyboard. Yeah. And then you would have your phone... Or, or it was like a, a, it was PDA. Like a, it was yeah, it was a like PDA. a, it was like a Palm Pilot. That's yes. how long ago this was. But you and you would drop it into this little portable yes. um, keyboard, and you would just type along. Yeah, that thing's gone the way of the dodo. Okay, so that you're not. I just use a laptop. Anymore. I use just like a small laptop. Okay, that would make sense yes. now. Yes. That laptops have gotten smaller <laughs> yes. as a result of that. But um, and so. So how do I do interviews? Yeah, how do you do interviews? I mean, so I teach writing as well. I teach writing at oh, yes. Lighthouse Writers Workshop, nonfiction. So I talk about, like, how I do interviews. So how I do interviews, uh, first, I do, my, I do my homework. I definitely read up on what's already been written about the person who I'm going to be uh, interviewing. But then I don't list out questions. Okay. I don't at all because what I do when I sit down with the person – the first thing I say to people is like, let's start at the beginning of your story. Okay. And most people assume it's like, oh, then you, the beginning of my story about the subject we're talking about. So, if Pete, if I was sitting down with you for the first time and said, so at the beginning of your story, you would think we're talking about uh, the Human Research Lab. You're like, oh, you want to learn about how I started Hurl? I would say, no. I want to start at the beginning of your story. Like with your childhood. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, and I do this for several reasons. Uh, first off, I think most people get nervous at first being interviewed, right? It's it's not necessarily a a common thing. And not always, but I feel like most people it's easier for them for the most part to talk about their childhood. Not in all cases, some people it's not so easy, but for many people it's like, okay, well I can talk you about told the like story a yeah. ton of times. Yeah. Um so that's a good way to start to get the ball rolling. And also because the thing that I really care about is narrative. Now I write I don't I, I tell my students, you want to write stories, you want to write, you want to write narratives, you want to write about subjects. So you, want, you want to always be thinking of the narrative. And I want my subjects to be thinking of narrative, too. I want to hear the narrative of I my see. subjects. So the most common question I end up asking in my interviews is, okay, and then what? And then what? Mm -hmm. So it gets them in the process. Like, I'm just going to be telling my story from the beginning to the middle to the end. And what's interesting is that I think... Most people never get a chance to do this in their lives. Most people will tell little anecdotes, you know. Yes. But how, how often do people get to sit down and, like, tell their story? So for many people, it can be, like, a liberating mm -hmm. um, experience. Yeah, especially because what happens oftentimes is in, um, in real life, People may be interested in the story, but they're not that interested. Yeah. They, wanna, they want it to be a conversation, 
Yeah. And so you you never get to go as deep or as long as your as when Joel Warner is interviewing. Yeah. And it helps to and you end up making these potential kind of connections. Um one example is in my classes, Pete is one of our first interviews, it was Jim Royal, while I was interviewing you for that first Westward story. Um, and we already spent some time together. I'd uh, learned about your research lab, and, you know, I'd probably sat in on some of your wacky experiments. Mm-hmm. And then um, at some point, we sat down and had a long conversation about, like, you growing up. Mm-hmm. It was a very lengthy conversation. And you probably thought at the time, like, why are we going into all the details about this? Because what does it have to do with the human research lab or my or my comedy stuff? And you started, like, kind of kind of opening up a little bit how, you know, you, like many people, faced some kind of challenges kind of growing up. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't always the kind of easiest kind of childhood, right? Yeah. And we started talking about, like, oh, so you think maybe some of your needs to keep everything kind of organized and tidy might have been in part a response to some of the chaos of childhood. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, like, necessarily, like, like, it was some, like, therapeutic breakthrough for you, right? But, it, and it's not saying I, I like, I solved the, the puzzle of people's <laughs> life, right? No. But it ended up being this nice kind of connection that I could then use when I was writing about kind of you as a narrative. Yeah, so the so um, Joel uh, talks about coming to my office at CU and ha- me having these nice tidy piles and, and coming to my house and me having this very, like, clean, you know, you're like, does someone live here? Freaky clean. Thing? Yes. And, you know, me admitting that that um, not only do I, like, I, you know, obviously it, I enjoy the efficiency of a, of a, and the aesthetics of a clean space, but also that that there's a psychological benefit that is like when, when life feels out of control, I tidy up. Yes. You know, I, I channel Marie Kondo. And so um, making that connection adds flavor in the story and it helps, I think, people better understand who, who is this person and why might that help or hurt his goal yeah. to crack, you know, the humor code, yeah. right, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, listening to this, I, I wonder, you know, in the, I mean, this is a short form, form podcast, right? It's an hour or less typically kind of a thing. And so, but even, I, you know, at times just saying, oh, tell me more about that might be something that I could add as a, as a way to interview people. Yeah. Because it may open up possibilities. So tell me more about, <laughs> about that, about your, about your interviewing. So, so one is, I mean, clearly you're very patient. You're also outstanding record keeper, right? So you're very good at capturing all these things. Like the fact that you're typing like a madman or scribbling like a madman, I think leads your your subject to continue. That's funny. I haven't thought about that because I always feel kind of bad while I'm typing while people are talking because I'm not. I it may seem like I'm distracted, but like like I tell my students it's like I just want to become like a detail vacuum I want to collect everything all the information I can at the, at the moment that's happening right I want to go and take photos of every wall of the room I'm in mm-hmm. every word they're saying down and then later figure out how to use it I, I think this was you it could be someone else but I'm pretty sure it was you that you even type stuff that you know you will never use for the reason that that it, it you know what I mean? You just want yeah. to capture everything. Yeah. And also, if you stop typing, then it suggests to the person they should stop talking about it. Yes, I that, definitely, yeah. yeah. I just always want momentum. I yeah. just want things. As an aside, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we work really closely and intensely on yeah. the humor code. And, you know, like any, I think, book project, it, it was like, it was exciting. It was fun. It was creative. It was challenging. It was exhausting. You know, it, it you know, it's a, it was a three-year process, yeah. you know, kind of thing. I mean, even more, probably, actually, as I think about it, by four. Yeah. It's funny with me working on a new book project. Like, at times, I find myself thinking about, because I'm in a different role yeah. now. Like, you, you did the heavy lifting with the wordsmithing and the, um, and the creating the structure in the book, because... You're the best in the world at that. I'm the best in the world. But yes. Well, you're idea. among the best in the world at doing that kind of thing, and I'm not, you know. And so 
So one, like there was one point of tension that we had was we would do these trips. So we would go to Japan, yeah. you know, and I was juggling the book project with my teaching, with my research, yeah. you know, with a relationship um, and so on. And you were juggling the book with family and, yeah. and, and, and everything, but we would, we would have these not the arguments, but we would have disagreements about how long the trip was supposed to be. Yeah. And I would try to make it shorter and you would try to make it longer. <laughs> and I understand. I mean, and, you know, I was always just like, well, you know, of course you want to go longer because these are great places to go largely and so on. But you, but you always were like, no, no, no. We need to be there as long as possible and we need to do as many things as possible because I just don't know when that one thing that makes the whole story is going to happen. Yeah. And so the longer we consume, the more likely it's going to to be, you know, to be the case. Yeah. And so... Because I think it's fishing for moments, right? You, you, you're telling for moments, and if you're... And, uh, and since then, I've, I've done more kind of, kind of travel-based assignments for a variety of publications, and there are times when, like, a publication like, sends me to a location for, like... Like, like two days, I see. you know, and I, and I come back and I'm just like, I just, like, I just don't end up with the scenes or the characters and the moment that you need to make a fully kind of breathing, kind of livable, livable story. You know, sometimes. And I think that's, that's in part, I mean, fewer of your publications have a travel budget to begin with. And those that do are like, okay, you, you get like two days in West Virginia to study, like, to report on, like, like the teacher strikes. And you better make sure that you you somehow capture all of the myriad characters. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good luck with that. Yeah. Right. And so I think about that because I'm, you know, I'm trying to accumulate examples. Yeah. And so, you know, the more examples I can accumulate, the more likely I can, you know, skim off the cream, yes, so to speak. And so this is not a travel, you know, I'm not doing a travel project, but nonetheless, that concept still. And so I, I kind of begrudgingly is like, he was right, you know. But it was just, for me, it was difficult. Yeah, I actually, you know, looking back, I feel like I mean, we usually win somewhere in the middle, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's actually, looking back, I'm never like, oh, man, we should have had so much more time in such, such a place. I feel like I was never felt like I was too yeah. pressed by any of those yeah, like, places. I, I, yeah, it's true. I, um, you know, there's some places I'd like to spend less time. <laughs> Where? <laughs> In the Amazon. <laughs> I like the Amazon. You had a better experience. I had a good time with the Amazon. You're, you're part of, that's part of the reason you're on this podcast is because, for the listener, you, you may not know this, but uh, Joel is an outstanding clown. I like to use something that some people out there know this. Uh, this, is like a, this, is, this is like a known fact. Well, I don't know if, if, you were to, if you were to, like, say, do you think, yeah, I don't know if you, it, oh, first of all, I don't think most people are just like, that guy would be a good clown. Probably not. And you don't match the kind of, I think. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but you were, um, you were, we, we went to the Amazon and we clowned with Patch Adams and mm -hmm. 100 yeah. hospital clowns. 100 hospital clowns. And so a bunch of South American yes. folks and then some from the U.S. Yeah. Kind of thing. And so, which is, it, which is a neat thing, which is like, you don't actually have to speak the same language to be able to clown. Yeah. That's, that's a neat, that's a really neat Universal thing. language. Clown clown language. Yes, that's right. And, um. I didn't like clowning that much, and as a result, I don't think I was very good at it. You weren't, you weren't that bad. Don't yeah. be yourself. Well, but you, but you had a knack for it, and um, I thought I, I really might have had some weird tropical disease that made me be crazy. <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was great. I ascribed it to your parenting fatherhood skills, but uh, yeah, I now think, reflecting on it, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, being willing to let go of your ego. I think that's, that's part of it because like you have you, you you look like a freak. You have to act like a freak. You can't be you can't be saying to yourself, "What do I look like right now?" Because yeah, you are you are you are in the middle of like the slums of the jungle, sweating from like head to foot, wearing the, the most like goofy garish like clothes that we got from like we went to the thrift store. The thrift store. And, and by the way, we were like the most normally dressed. Yeah, we were, and we still look like absolute <laughs> freaks. It, like, and just goof around people who had never seen you before, who sure had all sorts of probably very valid assumptions about uh, us as these, like, white dudes walking into their, you know, 
very difficult surroundings. And you'd have to put all that aside and just goof around. So probably, yeah, I mean, probably one being a, a father and ha and you, as, as a parent, you come to the realization, wow, you are no longer the star of the show. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, like, you, you're no longer cool. Like, you're no longer just like, like, even the star of your own story anymore. It's really like, it's all about like subjecting like your needs and your ego to the unending needs of these very small creatures mm -hmm. that need things all the time. Is that, and probably also being, being, being a journalist, because on one hand being a journalist like discourages you from putting yourself out there. Yeah, I mean, no, normally you, you're observing. Yeah, and, and yet at the same time it's also like as a journalist you you don't want to have too much of an ego anyway. So you want to, so maybe it's, maybe it's a bit tied to that too. I don't know. Well, if I remember correctly, you don't have to jog my memory, there were like sort of, there were writers, journalists that when, when we were working on the humor code that you, I think we're looking to in terms of the journalist who puts themselves in the place. Yeah. Is there someone in particular that comes to mind when you think about well, actually, the, the journalist who becomes a character. Well, actually, it's really it's really interesting you said that because I don't know if you remember this, but I the book that really both inspired me to in part become a journalist and also inspired how I thought about the humor code was a journalist named uh, Tony Horowitz. Okay, and he wrote a book called Confederates in the Attic. Oh yes, it I was do given this. to me by my thesis advisor in college, like right at, when I when I left and it I really kind of kind of struck with me. Now the sad part of the story is that um Tony just this past Monday kind of passed away at age sixty of a free kind of cardiac oh. arrest while on book tour for his new book. So it's funny I was just reading this kind of uh this kind of eulogy mm -hmm. about him today. But so he wrote this book called Confederates in the Attic, which was now came out in 1999, I think, where he went and explored how the Civil War was still being fought in the South. Uh, now it was an easier time than it is now, I think, and he could explore these concepts of what the Confederate flag means and these kind of Civil War reenactors in a slightly more kind of lighthearted and thoughtful way mm -hmm. than we might today where all of a sudden things like it was white supremacy are unfortunately much more kind of pressing and yeah, it was a different, yeah. it wasn't that long ago, yeah. but it was a different time. But he was someone, who, you know, he was this kind of unassuming, kind of white Jewish guy who'd long worked for NPR, and he put himself in these kind of kind of awkward, sometimes threatening situations where he was almost beat up at some, at some biker bar, he would hang out with white supremacists or like Ku mm -hmm. Klux Klan members, you know, and he wasn't, he was not the star of the book. Okay. But he did put himself out there because he wanted the reader to live vicariously through him. So, so the reader said, okay, I need, to, I need to show the reader what it's like to be here in this place, in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so that, yeah, and, so, and then obviously in the humor code, you're a character. Yeah. You're the voice. Yeah, but I really, I try, I try not to be like out there too much. Mm -hmm. In some ways I thought of myself almost like, this also kind of dates us, like, the cameraman in the TV show The Office. Oh, yes. Right? Where, for the most part, in The Office, the cameraman is just capturing what's happening. But every now and then, like, the main characters, whether it's what, Pam or Jim, Jim yeah. they would have, like, they, would, like, they like, would talk this way. Yeah, yeah, they would kind of gesture out. So that's how I almost saw myself as a character. Yeah, so I, um, you know, so, so kind of reflecting, even as we talk, like, I... I, I kind of think about, I mean, we had a lot of time together, and I, you know, me being an academic writer and you you being a real writer had, you, you taught me a lot about writing and about thinking about writing, and, um, and it was, it was, you know, I mean, I, you know me, I kind of like, I like to consume ideas. Yeah. So, you know, this, this notion of uh, hang, holding the baby, hanging the baby over the cliff. Yes. That's one of your techniques that you use. Yes. To talk about that. Okay. No, I talk, I, this is another topic that I talk about in teaching, and I use, once again, the Westward story about Peter McGraw okay. as an example of this. So I say, whenever you write something, you have to see it as entertainment. 
and some journalists might see that as sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. And no, we're this constitutionally protected, you know, thing we do that's all about exposing corruption and nailing the bastards to the wall. And I say, and my response is, you can do all that. But if you don't make it entertaining first, no one's going to read it, and it's not going to matter. So it's all about entertaining readers, keeping them hooked, keeping them reading. Because if you're writing a thousand words, or two thousand words, or sixty thousand words, there's so much demanding or their it attention. Yeah. Especially in the shit show this 2019, there's like a billion dumpster fires. People will constantly be distracted. I need to go on Twitter to see what's yeah. happening with Jon Snow. So you like, so you have to work your butt off to keep readers reading. So one of one of the kind of tricks that I sometimes use, as you said, is hanging the baby over the cliff, where in your very first section that you write, your very first scene, your lead section, you hang the baby over the cliff. Mm -hmm. And you leave the baby hanging there, and you can then write whatever you want to write with yeah. the hope that readers will keep reading because they want to find out what happens to the baby. Yeah, so in, in that, I don't remember what your technique was, but I'm guessing it had something to do with me trying to... So what happened? Okay, so the, <laughs> so the very first story I wrote about you was for Westward. The lead, the lead section starts with you walking into the Squire Lounge, mm -hmm. which was at that point this horrific dive bar on Colfax Avenue in Denver, known to having the hardest open mic night in in all of Denver, yeah, right? The, the MC that night said it's uh, the only bar that has an indoor outhouse. Yes. And the other people getting on stage were telling jokes about smoking smoking crack and slavery. And I write that, here's Peter McGraw, he's wearing a sweater vest. Yeah. And, now retired. Yes. And he was going to get up on stage, he's a professor, and try to stand up for the first time in his life. Why? Because he had this new theory called the benign relation theory. He wanted to see if it, was gonna, if it could hold up in the real world. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to build the tension, and finally, in my lead section, Pete gets called up on stage, grabs the microphone, and immediately disconnects it. Yeah. And, I, and, that's, <laughs> and that's where I end the lead section. So I, I end with Pete standing on stage with a disconnected microphone, about to do a stand-up Yeah, and so it, the, the, you know, just to ruin it, it doesn't get much better. It doesn't get much better after that. But <laughs> but the reader doesn't know that until the end of the uh, at the end of the article because they didn't get to it till the very end. Yeah, so, so. It's, it's, I, I I think of that sometimes. I can't say that I have had a chance to use it in any real profound way. But uh, but you know, even just the idea of like having strong leads and having strong kickers, you know, is something that I that I noted that you that you would do. You also told me the story, and again, I just know the vague details of it, but I'm sure you, you know it, is about the different ways that you can write a story. Right? There are these sort of different structures and different models of, of writing a story. And you told me about this kind of famous story about a journalist who wanted to do a story, I think it's about Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a yeah. bell? And the idea, it was a story, but... The journalist was unable to get an interview with Frank Sinatra yeah. and decided to persist anyways with the story and wrote a story without ever yeah. interviewing Frank Sinatra. One of those famous profiles. It was an Esquire called Frank Sinatra Has a Cold. Yeah. Because the excuse that Frank Sinatra or his publicist used at the time was like, Frank Sinatra has a cold. Frank has a cold. He won't be able to do any interviews with you. Mm -hmm. but now, in reality, it was kind of, it was getting kind of later in Sinatra's career. You know, there are some issues that you probably don't want to talk about, so it was definitely them trying to just kind of avoid for the writer. But the writer ended up writing this incredible profile by talking with every other possible person he could about Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Friends, family. He would be in the same place. Yeah, he would just be in the same place, and he would describe what Frank was doing at that moment. He describes him at this bar, playing pool, hitting on women. And using the very fact that Frank Sinatra has a cold as a symbol yeah. of that uh, of something has gone wrong in the world of Frank Sinatra. Yeah, it was a, it's a brilliant profile. Yeah, it's a neat it's a neat idea that like it just breaks the rules that you would normally have. Like in a profile, you need to talk to someone. Yes, and um, and yet you can make something that's entertaining and informative as a result yeah. a result of that. All right, so uh, you tried to use me earlier and failed with your log line for your um, your new project. Okay. I want to use you for a moment, and I want to get some, you know, I don't have you anymore helping. I'm too expensive for you, my too, friend. I can't, I can't afford you. <laughs> You're too busy. You have, a, you, have a better, you have a better deal, a better option. What advice do you have for me as I, as I work on this book? 
So the, so the yeah, idea okay. again yeah. is, um, you know, serious business lessons from the masters of comedy. So this is this is not a project about um, being funny at work. This is actually a project about how to think funny, how yeah. to think like a comedian, and then translate it into actually yeah. actionable lessons for for you know real people. People have real struggles yeah. in their life, but because it's a book about comedy, it has that entertaining yeah. element. So. So, yeah, I'm just curious as you, you know, knowing what you know about me and my limitations um, and this idea if you have anything that comes to mind that I should be doing. This might sound trite, but I would, throughout the process, I would continually ask yourself, am I having fun? Hmm. And I say this not because I'm concerned about your emotional well-being, Pete, or anything yeah, like that. Life's okay right now. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. not about that. But as I already said, like, as a writer, readers live vicariously through what you do. Mm -hmm. And as I said, whatever you write has to be entertaining first. Mm -hmm. So if at any point you're feeling like this is boring. If you're talking to someone and what they're saying, this, you say to yourself, this is boring. Or you're writing a, a couple paragraphs and, and you're saying to yourself, these paragraphs are boring, you're doing it wrong. I see. You know, you have to make sure that everything you write, every everything you do, everything you include in the book, or do for the book, is fun for you. Because otherwise it won't be fun for the reader and they will put down the book. You know, I, I actually don't think that's trite advice. Okay. And, and the reason is I used this technique to improve my teaching. So, I mean, I've, I've never been a bad teacher. I've, I always kind of had enough. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I think you're probably selling yourself short on the teaching. Yeah, I, you know, but I really made a decision that I was going to really improve my teaching. Yeah. And so I've, I went from, like, never being nominated for a teaching award to being nominated for teaching awards. Nice. To never winning a teaching award. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, look, it's, yeah. it's baby steps. But what I decided that I needed to do was I needed to make teaching more fun and enjoyable for me yeah. first, which sounds selfish. But once I did that, then all of a sudden my students started enjoying themselves because then, like, my personality could come out, my enthusiasm, yeah. you know, and so, so I get it, like, I mediate the experience yeah. of the audience, and so that's a good reminder because I do with my teaching. I mean, I mean, no one is going to feel compelled to read anything or consume any sort of content because they say, "Oh, this is important. Or, this is useful." I mean, so I think you have to have in mind like their needs and their and their their desire to. To be entertained. Yeah. And what is the ratio of entertainment to information? I don't look at the ratio. I think even in the parts where you where you have to convey information, it has to be as it does entertaining yes, too. Okay, that's great. We we're, we need to wrap up because you got to do your fatherly duties mm -hmm. coming up here. Um, but I uh, I want to know um, final question: What are you reading, watching, or listening to? That's really good, like outstanding, not just run-of-the-mill good. Okay. Um, so three things, if you can. At least one. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, so right now, I'm just reading crap. I'm reading, like, random, like, genre stuff. Okay. That's, I mean, oh, no, I'm also reading a massive amount of Bagri's on Marquis de Sade as my job. Yeah, sure. Um, so when I'm not, I'm reading crap. Listening to, I'm loving the new Vampire Weekend. Okay. Great. Really strong. That's fun. I like their early stuff. Yeah. I've, I've always liked Vampire Weekend. And I just think they're, they're, the new album called Father the Bride is awesome. It has okay. some nice kind of, more kind of Jason Isbell like kind of all country vibes I dig. Okay. Uh, watching. Mm, You've always liked Wilco and Uncle Tupelo. Yeah. Kind of dance. Yeah. So there's a bit of that. Now, watching. Um, so I've finished second season of the show Barry. Okay. Barry B U R Y. Yeah, no, B A R R Y. Oh, ba okay, yeah. On HBO, and especially if you're going out to Los Angeles and doing improv classes, you should watch that show. Okay, which I haven't. Um, focuses on this this hitman who 
decides he wants to be an actor in Hollywood and start, start going to classes at this kind of shitty kind of kind of theater school. Definitely has some gross point blank vibes okay. to it, okay. but it's wow, good. dark. That's a pulling it back from the past. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I highly enjoyed okay. watching that. That's great. Yeah. Super. So there you go. Joel. Yeah. Great to see you great again. Great to see you, man. So it's, you know, it's been too long. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I really appreciate the time. Yeah. And um, good to catch up. Very good. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit PeterMcGraw.org for more information about our guests, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation. On